first of all, let me say thank you all for coming. Um, I think this is a, a hopeful message. And let's begin. There is no work more honorable than working to eliminate nuclear weapons. We have won remarkable successes. In a world crammed with 70,000 weapons, we marched and protested and demanded that the world see this problem, acknowledge it, and do something. And those efforts were rewarded with massive cuts in the arsenals of the world's nuclear armed states. Over time, the US and the Soviet Union cut their arsenals by more than 90%. It is, without a doubt, the greatest success for any movement during demanding arms reductions in the history of mankind. But when the Soviet Union fell, people somehow assumed the work was done, that after such a stunning success, nuclear weapons arsenals would continue to decline until they finally disappeared. They assumed, in other words, that the problem would go away on its own. That hope has not been borne out by events. Nuclear weapons arsenals have remained largely unchanged for a decade. The belief in the value of these weapons remains strong in some quarters. And today, all the nuclear armed states are either upgrading their arsenals, increasing the size of their arsenals, or both. We are in the midst of a second nuclear arms race. And new dangers and threats remind us that our work is not done. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres has said that the risk of nuclear warfare is at its highest point in decades. So it's imperative to take up this work again and to finally eliminate nuclear weapons completely. And we ought to be able to do it. After all, a majority of Americans would get rid of nuclear weapons if they could. Americans, according to a recent poll by the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, all Americans, Democrats, independents, and even Republicans by a clear majority want a world without nuclear weapons. People understand that nuclear weapons are dangerous and fundamentally they agree with us. So why haven't we been able to win more support? There are three obstacles that keep people from embracing the elimination of nuclear weapons. Each is, a power, is powerful and has played a role in our past difficulties. The first is the belief that nuclear weapons are the ultimate weapon. Wars are sometimes won using modest weapons, but often having the biggest, most powerful weapon is decisive. So many people conclude, perhaps reluctantly, that it would be foolish to give up these powerful weapons. The second is the belief that keeping nuclear weapons is the only realistic option. This, there's a long tradition in the debate that the two sides can be separated into realists and idealists. And while it's true that many of us are motiv motivated by idealism, if we accept the realist versus idealist framing, it makes it virtually impossible to eliminate nuclear weapons. Let me say that again. If the debate about nuclear weapons is a contest between realists and idealists, we cannot win. The problem is that when survival is on the line, almost everyone wants to be a realist. When they're in a tight spot and their life is at stake, most people want the most realistic plan possible for getting out of it. Hardly anyone says, I want an idealistic plan for escaping this deadly situation. And the current risk of nuclear war is clearly a deadly situation. The third obstacle grows out of the other two. There's a widely held belief that eliminating nuclear weapons isn't for everyone. It's just for lefties and hippies. We'll never win until we convince people that eliminating nuclear weapons is for everyone. Look, you and I know that nuclear weapons are immoral, they're horrible, and ought to go. There's no way to build a plausible case that nuclear weapons are moral, and anyone who thinks they're not horrible needs to take a little closer look at what happened at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. But if we're being honest, we also have to admit those arguments don't work if people think there are other realist arguments that overrule them. 
A person who thinks that only nuclear weapons can save them in a crisis won't give them up for moral reasons. So what do we do? I want to tell you about a new approach to eliminating nuclear weapons that overcomes these obstacles and clears the way for everyone to support elimination. I've spent 40 years trying to figure out how to win this debate and create arguments that will convince everyone, left, right, and center, that we need to eliminate these weapons now. I've laid them out in my book, It Is Possible, A Future Without Nuclear Weapons. It takes a new approach. Its arguments are entirely new, built on facts, common sense. It makes pragmatic arguments that persuade across ideologies. So Richard Rhodes, the historian who won the Pulitzer Prize twice for his massive four-volume history of nuclear weapons, calls the book a stunning breakthrough work. Um, Emma Pike, who's fast becoming the most important influencer among young people on this issue, says of the book, if you only ever read one book about nuclear weapons, let it be this one. Easy to read, meticulously well reasoned. It is an almost disarming, it has an almost disar disarmingly straightforward answer for every conceivable challenge to the idea that a future free from nuclear weapons can exist. But perhaps the most remarkable endorsement is from George Lee Butler, a retired four star US Air Force general and a former commander of STRATCOM. He called the book the most intelligent, comprehensive, and compelling argument ever advanced against nuclear weapons. Apparently, Butler feels that these arguments pass the realism test. In all seven Nobel Peace Prize laureates, current and past world leaders, two four-star generals, UN officials, two Pulitzer Prize winning historians of nuclear weapons, physicists, religious leaders, business people, activists, and others, have endorsed this new approach. So what I wanna do is outline these arguments for you, and then we can have a discussion about them and we can talk a little bit about how they might be used to get elimination done. So let's start with the obstacle created by the realist versus idealist framing. Getting past this obstacle is actually pretty easy. It is this, when government officials and nuclear weapons advocates say they're realists, don't believe them. They think they are, but they're not. They're not. They are weapons romantics. They're infatuated with these weapons and fantasies of ultimate power. Government officials and advocates for nuclear weapons sometimes sound like realists, but if you look closely at their arguments, they aren't realistic. Take the argument that lots of nuclear weapons advocates make that nuclear weapons will always exist. Here, for example, is Guy Roberts, former NATO Deputy Assistant General Secretary for Weapons and Mass Destruction Policy. Unfortunately, the weapons we've invented cannot be uninvented. We must live with them. Living with destructive technologies is our lot. The modest punishment we must bear for progress. The bomb is with us to stay. It is, after all, the ultimate guarantee of safety, guardian of safety. On its face, this rather bold assertion seems undeniable, and most Americans have been taken in by it. But it's nonsense. It is absolutely true that you can't disinvent nuclear weapons, but when you look closer, it's clearly nonsense. While it's possible to disassemble a piece of technology, there's no such thing as disinventing one. Disinvention is a process that does not exist. No piece of technology has ever been disinvented. These so-called realists are making an argument that relies on something entirely imaginary. That's like me saying, I will live forever because I can't be reverse born. Sounds impressive when I say it because I can't, in fact, be reverse born, but that's only because being reverse born is a process that doesn't exist. Now, if you're a realist, why would you make an argument using an imaginary process? Another way you know this argument is nonsense is that technology goes away all the time. 
There are, after all, no biplanes, blunderbusses, or catapults in any fighting force in the world today. But blunderbusses didn't go away because they were disinvented. Somehow, some other way, they went away. Nuclear weapons advocates use the disinvention argument because it convinces people that we need to keep nuclear weapons forever, not because it's realistic. They're not realists. Here's what an actual realist would say about whether nuclear weapons can go away or not. Human beings have been improving and upgrading their tools for over 12,000 years. There's an established process for how this happens. New tools are created. Old ones are abandoned. So to understand how nuclear weapons will go away, all we have to do is study evolution, the evolution of technology. Technological evolution is governed by a life cycle that has four distinct phases, invention, adoption, use, and eventual abandonment. And it turns out adoption, use, and abandonment are all driven by the same factor, not disinvention, but utility. If something is useful, it gets adopted. If it remains useful, it stays in use. If it stops being useful, it is summarily abandoned. Other factors sometimes speed up or delay the process, but utility is what ultimately drives change. So if you want to know if nuclear weapons are going to go away or not, or how to make them go away, ignore this nonsense about disinvention. You need to focus on abandonment. We should be asking ourselves questions like, what happened when Blackberries got elbowed aside by iPhones? Why did catapults get replaced by cannons? In other words, if we can understand how abandonment works and what the criteria are for abandonment, then we can figure out how to get people to want to abandon nuclear weapons. So how does abandonment work? In general, it happens in two ways. Both are based on utility. One is much more common. First and most common way is that some newer or better piece of technology replaces an existing type of technology. We're all familiar with this process. Cassette tapes often got jammed. So when CDs came along, cassette tapes got abandoned. Then came chips that could store hundreds of songs and soon, People stopped buying CDs and bought iPods instead, and so on. The most common way that technology gets abandoned is replacement. Some new device comes along and takes its place. But there's a second way. It happens less often, but it does occur. Call it realization. Here, people adopt a piece of technology and use it for a time and then realize that even though it seemed really cool and desirable when it first appeared, it actually wasn't that useful. Nothing replaces it. It is simply dropped for lack of utility. A good example of this sort of abandonment is the Hiller VZ-1. The Hiller VZ-1 was amazing technology. Invented by the Army in 1952, it had a small helicopter blade that spun around under a platform. It could lift a single soldier 15 or even 20 feet off the ground. This is actually a picture of the Navy's version of the Hiller VZ-1. Um, when they heard the Army was doing building a flying platform, they immediately decided they needed to build a flying platform too. And you have to admit, this is really cool stuff. I mean, what kid would want one of these? But eventually, people realized that a soldier hovering in midair over a battlefield would be kind of noticeable and vulnerable and actually unlikely to survive more than a few minutes. Once people realized its lack of military utility, the Hiller VZ-1 was abandoned without a second thought. So if nuclear weapons advocates are actually realists, and they're not, but if they were, they wouldn't spend their days putting on a stern face and saying, you just have to accept that nuclear weapons will always exist. If they were realists, they'd try to figure out what the criteria are that govern how any type of technology goes away and then see if those criteria apply to nuclear weapons, which is what we're gonna do 
right now, because we are the realists in this debate. We are the ones looking objectively at the facts. There are two criteria that determine which technologies get abandoned. The first and most important one is utility. Is the technology useful? Does it work? But there's a second one as well. The second one is, is it dangerous? You have to include this because sometimes you give up a piece of technology because while it's pretty useful, it's way too dangerous. This is what happened with liquid nitroglycerin, which worked really well as an explosive, but when you were transporting it from place to place, even a minor bump or shake could detonate it. Eventually, people figured out a way to stabilize it, and it became widely used as TNT. So we have to consider danger as well as usefulness as a criterion for abandoning technologies, because sometimes danger outweighs utility. So for the next little while, I'm going to talk to you about a rarely discussed pragmatic question. Just how useful are nuclear weapons? We all know they're awesome, the big explosion, the towering cloud. But how useful are they, really? Generally, there are three situations where people talk about using nuclear weapons. On the battlefield, in long-range attacks against homelands, and for deterrence. Let's briefly examine each one in turn. I'll start with utility on the battlefield. I think the results will shock you. You might imagine nuclear weapons are so powerful. Of course, they're decisive on the battlefield. But when you examine the question more closely, they're actually too big to be useful. On a typical battlefield, opposing troops can be anywhere from a third of a mile to a few yards apart. A 10 kiloton tactical battlefield nuclear weapon, and the majority of ground-based battlefield weapons in the Russian arsenal are 10 kilotons, or about a third as powerful as the Hiroshima bomb. That size bomb creates a circle of severe effects that's about roughly a mile across with circles of diminishing effects out to about five miles, which means if you use a nuclear weapon against their frontline troops, you are almost certain to kill some of your frontline troops. And even if your troops are separated from theirs by a significant difference, there's another problem, radiation. Wind can spread lethal radiation from a 10 kiloton explosion up to 25 miles in an hour, and less dangerous fallout can be carried hundreds or even thousands of miles farther. So nuclear weapons, which release radiation, leave you at the mercy of the wind. If it's blowing the wrong way, you can't use the weapons. You'll kill your own guys. The size and the radiation they release make it difficult to find a practical, useful role for nuclear weapons on the battlefield. And history confirms this. Bogged down in Korea, U.S. military planners considered using nuclear weapons. Ike said he was willing to do it, but after they studied the matter, his military advisors argued against it. When French soldiers were surrounded at Dien Bien Phu in Vietnam fighting the Viet Minh, there were discussions about giving the French three tactical nuclear weapons. But French leaders apparently decided it was better to lose the war. And when Dien Bien Phu fell, that is what happened than to try to use nuclear weapons at such close quarters. When the United States was fighting in Vietnam, the U.S. forces uh, and U.S. forces were surrounded at Khe Sanh, the field commander requested the use of nuclear weapons, but Washington rejected the idea. In the run-up to the Gulf War, Secretary of State Dick Cheney suggested that the use of nuclear weapons should be explored, but the study produced by Chairman of the Joint Chiefs Colin Powell found so many weapons would have to be used to destroy even a single armored division of the Republican Guard, that the idea was unceremoniously dropped and all copies of the study destroyed. But the most powerful piece of evidence about whether it makes sense to try to use nuclear weapons on the battlefield comes from 1991. For decades, the US plans for defending Europe had been built around using thousands of battlefield nuclear weapons. But after decades of careful study, political leaders and military strategists in Washington apparently became convinced that defending Europe with nuclear weapons made no sense. 
1991, George H.W. Bush, Bush Sr., not a rash man, not a disarmer, with the approval of the military, ordered the unilateral withdrawal of all but a symbolic handful of those battlefield weapons. This non-use, spanning the better part of a century, is not an accident. They didn't forget to use the weapons. They weren't immobilized by fear or awe. They weren't held back by a taboo. War is a brutally pragmatic business, and countries general, general, generally do whatever is necessary to win. Viewed objectively, the undeniable lesson from these, this long non-use is that nuclear weapons are just not that useful militarily. And this is in keeping with practical experience. The whole trend in war over the last 50 years has been away from big, blundering weapons and towards smaller, smarter, more accurate, more discriminate weapons. What common sense and the evidence of history shows is that nuclear weapons are entirely unsuited for use on the battlefield. Of course, most people don't think of battlefields when they think about nuclear war. They think about attacks on an adversary's homeland, on tax, attacks on cities. Our ideas about how long-range nuclear war would go come from the 50s and 60s, when there were only two giants towering over all the other countries, the United States and the Soviet Union. In such a bipolar world, it was just possible to imagine a war that devastated both of these giants but still left them bigger than any other country. And so whichever of the two giants recovered fastest might be considered, in some sense, to be the winner. Many people still imagine nuclear war this way as horrible, but in some, some sense, winnable. But that kind of war is no longer possible. In today's multipolar world, if the United States and Russia fought a nuclear war, they would again be left in ruins, but now other countries would tower over them. China would be the strongest world power and would probably move quickly to impose its will on world affairs. Or on the other hand, if the U.S. fought a nuclear war with China, then India, Europe, Japan, even Russia would no doubt vie for supremacy in the post-war world. Fighting a nuclear war today merely ensures that when the war ends, your country will be crippled, starving, poisoned, and no longer in control of its own destiny. Does it make sense to call a weapon useful if it leaves your country devastated and powerless? Would you call a gun useful that fires one bullet out the barrel and a second bullet back into your face? It's difficult to argue that fighting the long-range homeland-to-homeland war with nuclear weapons would be anything other than folly. So an objective, realistic review of the two military uses on the battlefield and homeland to homeland doesn't conclude that nuclear weapons are the ultimate weapon, far from it. The reality is that nuclear weapons are too big, too clumsy, too wasteful, and spread too much poison in whichever direction the wind happens to be blowing to have any military utility at all. Of course, nuclear weapons advocates respond that no one really wants to use nuclear weapons. Their real utility is as deterrence, and nuclear deterrence guarantees safety, they say. My advice is, when you hear nuclear weapons advocates say this, do the same thing you do when you hear them say nuclear weapons can't be disinvented. Don't believe them. Nuclear deterrence is neither safe nor reliable, and any child can see it. Of course, if we're going to be realistic, and I think we need to be to win, we have to admit that nuclear deterrence does work some of the time, perhaps even most of the time. But is that good enough? Is almost all the time sufficient. The problem is that nuclear war would be so devastating that to be safe, nuclear deterrence has to be perfect for all time. 
even one failure could be catastrophic. So has nuclear deterrence been perfect in the past? Can it be perfect into the distant future? Many people assume that nuclear deterrence has never failed because there's never been a nuclear war. But in fact, nuclear deterrence has failed repeatedly. In 1948, even though the U.S. had a monopoly on nuclear weapons, Joseph Stalin wasn't deterred from blockading Berlin in a dangerous standoff that lasted almost a year and could easily have touched off a war at any point. During the Korean War, even though the U.S. moved nuclear-capable bombers to Guam, within range of Cuba, and then leaked word of the deployment, that didn't stop the Chinese from sending hundreds of thousands of soldiers into the war. In 1973, everyone knew the Israelis had nuclear weapons. It had been reported in the New York Times. But that didn't stop Egypt and Syria from launching a war against the Israelis. In 1982, the Argentines attacked the Falkland Islands, even though the United Kingdom had nuclear weapons, and they did not. And in the run-up to the Gulf War, the U.S. solemnly warned Saddam Hussein that it would use the strongest possible response if he launched chemical weapons against U.S. forces, set Kuwaiti oil wells on fire, or attacked U.S. allies. Despite this, the Iraqis set more than 600 oil wells on fire and repeatedly launched Scud missile attacks on Israel. But the most frightening deterrence failure came during the Cuban Missile Crisis. President John F. Kennedy knew that if he blockaded Cuba with so many troops so close to each other, with so much tension, any mistake could spiral into global nuclear war. But despite that risk, Kennedy went ahead with the blockade. And there were times when the confrontation came within a hair's breadth of getting out of control. Perhaps the most serious came on Saturday, October 27, 1962, at the height of the crisis, both sides on hair trigger alert, when the guidance system on an American U-2 spy plane taking air samples over the North Pole malfunctioned. The plane eventually strayed off course 300 miles inside the Soviet Union. The Soviets saw it and immediately scrambled MiGs to shoot it down. The U.S. scrambled F-102s to find it and protect it. But because it was the height of the crisis, U.S. forces were at DEFCON 2, one step below nuclear war. Air Force procedures at that time dictated that at DEFCON 2, all the fighters in the Alaska Command had their normal air-to-air missiles removed and replaced with nuclear air-to-air missiles. So the only weapons those American fighters had as they roared towards Soviet airspace were nuclear weapons. If those two groups of fighters had found each other and fought it out, There would have been a nuclear explosion over the Soviet Union and almost certainly a nuclear war. They didn't find each other. But it wasn't the magic of deterrence that prevented war. Years later, when Robert McNamara, Kennedy's defense secretary, was asked, how did we all survive that crisis? He said, it was luck. And he's right. That's a sobering thought. Nuclear deterrence failed during the Cuban Missile Crisis, but on that day, like the other days when nuclear deterrence has failed, we were lucky. The fate of civilization, your fate, my fate, was decided by chance. The harsh facts of the matter are that nuclear deterrence can fail, has failed, and will fail in the future. The problem with nuclear deterrence is that it has built into it a component that can fail catastrophically. This crucial component actually has a history of failure. And that component is us, human beings. Human beings make mistakes, not just frontline soldiers, but leaders as well. No one's perfect. I'm not perfect. Are you perfect? Human beings are fallible. 
And human beings play an essential role in nuclear deterrence. Human beings make the threats. Other human beings evaluate the threats, decide how to respond. Nuclear deterrence isn't a machine that runs quietly on its own in a corner. We run the entire process. So if human beings are prone to folly, and we are, and if human beings are involved in nuclear deterrence, and we manage every step, then nuclear deterrence is, by definition, inherently flawed. It will fail repeatedly. One day our luck will run out and we'll end up in a catastrophic war. It's not a question of if, it's just a matter of when. Nuclear deterrence is too dangerous to rely on over the long run. It can work, but the longer you rely on it, the more certain it is to end in catastrophe. So if you look objectively, at the utility of nuclear weapons, setting aside everything else, awesomeness, power, morality, all that to one side, just looking at utility, the bottom line is pretty sobering. They're so big and randomly spread so much poison that they're virtually useless on the battlefield. They're suicidal used in attacks on homelands. And although nuclear deterrence can work, over the long run, it is bound to result in nuclear war. It is uncomfortable to face these realities, these ultimate weapons that we've believed in for so long, that we have invested so much hope and energy, not to mention trillions of dollars. So much we put into them and that we thought of as the foundation of our alliances and the source of our status, these decisive weapons turn out to be virtually useless. And instead of guaranteeing our safety through deterrence, it turns out they are engines of disaster. Being a realist, it turns out, is pretty grim work. But the payoff for facing the world as it is, is significant. You understand your options better. And when you look at the reality of nuclear weapons, yes, you lose some sense of security and status, but you gain the realization that we can let these weapons go. We don't have to live under the threat of a sudden annihilation for the rest of eternity. Facing reality is the only way to find realistic hopes. And once you examine nuclear weapons realistically, the answer to the question, should they be abandoned, is undeniably clear. It is a resounding yes, absolutely. Nuclear weapons have power over us because they're swathed in myth. How do we shake people awake and dispel the myth? Reality. Insist on reality. Tell everyone that there is a way out of this deadly situation, that we have a realist plan for escaping, that the people who would have them believe in nuclear weapons are dreamers, fantasists, romantics, infatuated with weapons that are as dangerous as liquid nitrogen, nitroglycerin. Focus on reality. Tear down the comforting myths. Point to the objective fact. And tell people that if they really want out of this perilous trap we're in, they better listen to the genuine realists, not the people who believe in dark fever dreams of ultimate power. We should all know that nuclear weapons don't guarantee our safety, if only because a genuine realist knows there are no, there are no guarantees in life. It will require a movement. It took millions of signatures on petitions and referendums at election time and a million people marching in New York to make the freeze movement that led to the reductions in arsenals in the 80s. This time we're going to have a different goal, complete elimination. But in terms of the process, this will be no different from the freeze. So we know this can be done. We did it before. We can do it again. The reason most people can't imagine getting rid of nuclear weapons is that they think nuclear weapons are the most valuable weapons on earth. It's really hard to give up something valuable. But since we've established that the reality is that they're not valuable, 
They're lumps of coal, not sparkling diamonds. We know that they'll be much easier to give up. Think about the Biological Weapons Convention that banned biological weapons worldwide in 1972. It was clear to everyone that biological weapons had virtually no military value. <laughs> COVID has since proved it. If a single infection in China can spread around the globe and kill something like 11 million people worldwide, including a million in China itself, then how do you control a war where each explosion shoots millions of microscopic pathogens into the soil, sea, and air? If you use biological weapons, they're almost certain to come back and harm you, your soldiers, your people, your regime. Biological weapons are scary. They involve complicated science, and they're enormously dangerous. But it turns out they're lousy weapons. Once people realized this, once perceptions came into line with reality and a consensus emerged, the biological weapons were clumsy, dangerous weapons with little military value. How long do you think it took to negotiate the Biological Weapons Convention that banned these weapons worldwide? How long? Any guesses? Two years. If we can change people's perceptions of nuclear weapons so that they match reality, so that people see nuclear weapons the same way they saw biological weapons, scary, requiring complicated science, enormously dangerous, but lousy weapons, then why couldn't we ban nuclear weapons in two years as well? Nobody keeps technology that's virtually useless and very dangerous. Nobody keeps a stove that can't boil water and has a tendency to explode. Nobody keeps the Hiller VZ-1. Nobody keeps bombs you can't use in war and that threaten to destroy civilization. Imagine a movement like the Freeze Movement with petitions, referendums, resolutions in towns, cities, counties, and state legislatures, all declaring that nuclear weapons are lousy weapons and should be abandoned. Not only because they're immoral, but because they're stupid weapons. Then imagine a U.S. president bowing to the pressure of this movement, this mass movement, declaring from the well of Congress that henceforth it will be the policy of the United States that nuclear weapons are obsolete, that the United States will neither build nor research any new weapons. At the same time, we won't get rid of a single weapon until every other nuclear armed state agrees, but in the meantime, we'll lead a worldwide effort to build a consensus that the reality is that nuclear weapons are useless, dangerous weapons that we could just as easily abandon. Once that consensus is reached, not only will it be possible to have a treaty that disarms all nuclear armed states at the same time, those states will want to abandon these dangerous, useless weapons. Nobody keeps technology that is both useless and dangerous. We live in a magnificent, bountiful world. I've traveled to many lands, made many friends, and have seen with my own eyes that the great worldwide civilization that has been handed down to us, that we and all our forebearers have built together, is a rich, is rich with breathtaking works of art, vibrant traditions, magnificent structures, ancient faiths, vast repositories of knowledge, and great halls where we can gather together and share our common humanity. Look down on the civilization we have made. We, together, have constructed a thing of beauty that shines with a million points of light. Imagine for a moment that that world could be safe. Imagine a future without nuclear weapons. It won't be a world without risk. It won't be a world without war. It won't be a perfect world. But it will be a world where we won't, in some corner of our brain, be haunted by a fear that maybe today, maybe tomorrow, maybe next month, but someday, all that we have and all that we've built could suddenly be blown to rubble and ashes. <laughs> 
what a weight it would be to lift that sense of foreboding off our shoulders. A world without nuclear weapons will be a world where children can dream of being an astronaut, an inventor, or something amazing. And no voice will ever whisper in their heads, your future may never come. A world without nuclear weapons will be a world where we shake off our timidity and anxiety and take up bold and exciting plans to make a better, more fulfilling future. Eliminating nuclear weapons will not solve our problems, but it will give us a shot of energy, of confidence, of determination. Perhaps it will even bring back the kind of brash optimism that actually welcomes adversity because overcoming great difficulties calls forth what is best in all of us. It will go a long way, in other words, toward restoring the sense that humankind is big enough to take on any challenge. There are those who say that our fate will be determined by nuclear weapons. In their telling, the world is, the weapons are big and we are small. The weapons are in control and we are powerless. But I do not believe that, and I don't think you believe it. Ultimately, machines will not decide what happens to humanity. Technology is our servant, not our master. Human destiny is in the hands of human beings. We must admit the reality that nuclear weapons have always been lousy technology and use that knowledge to build a consensus that will finally convince us all to abandon these dangerous and useless weapons. So let us take up the work before us to protect the defenseless, to safeguard the wonders of our common civilization, to bring back hope to an anxious world. Because a future without nuclear weapons is possible. I... I, I'm not exactly sure. I'm a guy who spent 30 years in a room trying to figure out these arguments. You have actually more experience with the front lines of trying to persuade people than I do. But I think there are two, three steps that are crucial. The first is there's a taboo on talking about nuclear weapons. People don't talk about nuclear weapons, and there's a reason for it. They don't talk about nuclear weapons because They're convinced there's nothing that can be done. And so the first step is to break the taboo, talk about the weapons, and then say, and the reason I'm talking about them is because there's a a real solution. And if you can get people somehow, the, the trick is to hook them in with something that makes them say, huh, maybe there is a solution. Maybe that's a quote from a general, or maybe it's a clever line that you come up with that says, that quotes JFK, for instance, who said, no problem of human beings is beyond the power of human beings, but any problem we create, we can solve. Um, but the, the initial hurdle is always that people don't believe anything is possible to be done. And so that's the the first step. And then I think you just use these arguments. I mean, uh, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, They use them on the battlefield. That's dumb. In fact, when Putin was threatening to use nuclear weapons on the battlefield in Ukraine, the New York Times, the Institute for the Study of War, and General David Petraeus all came out and said, nah, they're actually not that useful on the battlefield. It's been kind of an open secret in Washington. So that's easy to dismiss. Pretty easy to show that it's suicidal to use them in a country-to-country war. And deterrence, I think the argument against deterrence could be made by a 12-year-old. So I think it has two steps. You, you, You hook them in somehow, and then you give them the realist arguments and say, bing, 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 not useful and dangerous. And that ought to do it. It's tough. It's tough overcoming a myth, which is what we're facing. It's a kind of a religion. But the only way I know to dispel 
the people who believe that their volcano that they live next to on an island is a god is to just tell them the truth and explain the science and say, hmm, not a god, actually. Um, U.S. militarism is a, and our tendency to want to bomb people is a separate problem. I think, I think if you, if you think your main tool in foreign policy for keeping yourself safe is nuclear deterrence, there's a tendency to think that bombing is, you know, there are different things you can do to deter your enemy. And the one at the top of the ladder is bombing. And so relying on nuclear weapons kind of reinforces this idea that, oh, bombing is should be our main reliance. So that's part of it, I think. It might be easier to convince people to use economic deterrence or some other means if we weren't relying on nuclear weapons. But the, the problem with Iran and those other countries is that there are these weapons that are called the currency of power. There have been different ones across history. I'm writing a paper on this. Uh, chariots were really big in the ancient world. If you wanted to be a great king, you had to have a bunch of chariots. Um, mounted knights were some. Uh, battleships in the 19th century were a big deal. But the problem with taking a weapon and then making it into a symbol and of national greatness is that you encourage arms races around that weapon and you encourage other people to want to get it because you say this is the most powerful weapon and so it's great and blah 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 um and what's fascinating about it for me is that it turns out a lot of those weapons that were designated the currency of power and gave you status and so on we're actually lousy weapons. Chariots are terrible weapons. Um, if, you, if you're a guy in the back of a chariot, you have a sword, and there are three horses pulling the chariot, you can't reach the enemy because the horses have all either run over them already or they've run out of the way because the horses are coming at them. If you have a spear and you spear someone and you're in the back of a chariot and he weighs more than you do, his weight will drive you right out the back of the chariot. The two of you will be lying on the ground together. Chariots are not useful weapons, it turns out. I'm, I'm sorry, it's a little dig digression. This is what happens when you talk to somebody who's a historian. But I think that the what you're getting at is that Iran thinks that nuclear weapons are the way to have safety. And I think the reason for that is that We've promoted that idea by making them the currency of power. And if we said, oh, actually, we're, we think they're obsolete, that would devalue them and other countries would look around for other ways to have safety. We would only keep the weapons until we had convinced everyone else that they were stupid weapons. As soon as the consensus takes hold, then the weapons go. We sign a treaty that eliminates everyone's weapons together at the same time. Well, of course we know what we know. The bombing of Hiroshima stunningly forced a stubborn adversary to surrender and miraculously did it in just four days. But if the experts and strategists who first considered nuclear weapons in 1945 somehow got this crucial piece of data wrong, since it's really the only practical experience we have to go on, doesn't that make Hiroshima vitally important? Um, I wrote an article about this in International Security, and it made a careful and factual case that nuclear bombings did not force Japan to surrender. And it argued instead that it was the Soviet entry into the war that forced them to give up. Among the many reasons that it was the Soviet entry into the war that forced Japan to surrender, let me mention just four, very briefly. First, it makes sense that Japan surrendered because of the Soviet declaration of war, because that's what they said they'd do. When the Supreme Council, the effective ruling body of Japan in 1945, met in June to review the war situation, they agreed 
that if the Soviets declared war, they would have to surrender. As General Kwabe Toroshiro put it, the absolute maintenance of peace in our relations with the Soviet Union is imperative for the continuation of the war. So they said they'd surrender if the Soviets came in. The Soviets declared war at midnight on the night of August 8th, 9th, two days after we bombed Hiroshima. Japan's leadership began meeting an emergency session early that same morning. And by 10.30 on the 9th, the Supreme Council had been convened to discuss surrender for the first time in 14 years of war. After much debate, by 4 a.m. the next morning, they tearfully agreed to surrender. They said they'd surrender if the Soviets came in. The Soviets came in, and within 28 hours, they took the decision to surrender. Second, war is fundamentally a military contest. Military contests are decided by military outcomes. When Wyatt Earp, his brothers, and Doc Holliday shot it out with the Clanton brothers at the OK Corral, it wasn't the side that shot the most bystanders that won the gunfight. It was the side that killed the most gunslingers that won. War, in case you need reminding, is about defeating military forces. That is its point. Killing civilians may be emotionally satisfying to the bloody-minded, but it is essentially irrelevant to the outcome. Third, I have searched through thousands of years of history, and I've done this work looking for 23 years. I've never been able to find an instance where destroying a city or killing civilians en masse led to surrender. This applies to all periods of history, including modern war. So, for example, Winston Churchill didn't surrender when London was bombed or Coventry flattened. Hitler didn't surrender when Hamburg was burned and 37,000 people were killed. Stalin didn't surrender when Leningrad was besieged for 872 days and something like a million civilians starved. This gives a sense for where, for how leaders think about civilians in wartime. But perhaps the clearest evidence about the place that civilians occupy in wartime calculations comes from China. 1938, when the Japanese forces broke through in central China, um, it looked very much as if they were going to overrun the entire country. Chiang Kai-shek, the leader of China at that time, ordered the dams on the Yellow River to be blown. The subsequent flooding throughout all of central China did, in fact, slow Japan's advance and allow time for Chinese forces to reorganize. You could argue that Chiang's decision saved China from Japanese conquest. The flooding also, however, killed 500,000 Chinese civilians. Chang, by his own order, killed half a million of his own people. In wartime, when important military ends are in view, civilian lives simply don't matter. Finally, Japan's leadership at that time was one of the least likely groups to surrender because of civilian deaths. They were almost all military men who'd been raised on a fanatical version of Bushido, a warrior's code that came down from the samurai. Bushido was a harsh and demanding code of conduct. Surrender by soldiers or civilians was highly discouraged. So when the U.S. invaded Iwo Jima, there were about 22,000 Japanese soldiers on the island. Of those 22,000, only 216 prisoners were taken during the fighting. Some of these were unconscious when they were captured. In all, less than 1% of Japanese soldiers surrendered. In that same June meeting, where they discussed the importance of Soviet neutrality, Japan's leaders also drew up an imperial rescript. It's a special form of um, statement or policy for the emperor to publish that called on all Japanese civilians to use whatever means necessary to repulse U.S. soldiers once the invasion of Japan began. Garden tools should be used, or if they didn't have those, the rescript said, civilians could sharpen a piece of bamboo and use that to charge at Americans with. If you're wondering if Japan's leaders were soft-hearted about civilians, so soft-hearted that they might have surrendered to prevent more of them from being bombed, 
You have only to imagine a 13 year old boy with the words of his emperor echoing in his head, charging an American machine gun nest with a sharpened bamboo stake. The notion that killing civilians with nuclear bombs can win wars is a belief that is presented as authoritative, but that is at variance with the aims of war and contradicts thousands of years. So partly this argument is built on the myth of nuclear weapons. And this is why I objected so much to the Oppenheimer movie where they, they, they pumped up the hype about nuclear weapons. The United States bombed 68 cities in Japan in the summer of 1945. Um, two of those attacks were with atomic bombs. If you graph all the people immediately killed in all um, 68 of those attacks, Hiroshima is second behind Tokyo, which was a conventional attack. Uh, if you graph the square miles destroyed, Hiroshima is sixth. Five other attacks with conventional bombs destroyed more square miles of city. If you calculate the percentage of the city destroyed, Hiroshima is 17th. Toyama, a town about the size of Chattanooga, Tennessee at the time, was 99.5% destroyed. So we imagine that someone with five nuclear bombs could conquer the world, but that's because somehow we've gotten this notion that that is widely held, that nuclear weapons are these amazing, powerful, magic weapons. You know, if, if some country built five nuclear weapons, two things would happen. One, everyone would say, yeah, he's another Hitler, or she's another Hitler. And which is what people said when Hitler rose up. They said, he's another Napoleon. They immediately would say, this guy's dangerous and a threat. And they would band together to oppose him. And if you've got five nuclear weapons and you're fighting the U.S. and Russia and China and England, France, there are two problems here. One is those countries are all building their nuclear arsenals back. And if you don't take over the world in six months, you're going to be fighting a country that has a nuclear arsenal that's bigger than yours, depending on what the treaty is like that finally gets rid of nuclear weapons. So you've got to conquer the, with your five nuclear weapons or your 15 You've got to conquer the world lickety split or else, you know, you're not going to get there. The other problem is the U.S. has all this fancy stealth, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, we can take out some of those weapons. And the final thing is, you know, if it were a choice between letting someone conquer the world and losing five cities, most countries would choose to lose the five cities. In 1939, the British were convinced that Adolf Hitler would bomb their cities with chemical weapons. They were so convinced of it, they made everyone carry gas masks with them, everyone, every, anytime they were in public. And what they were saying was, you know, we might lose some cities, but we're going to oppose this guy no matter what. So I think the thing is, I mean, it's a, it's a problem, but I don't think it's as difficult a problem as it is, and I don't think it's as much about trust as it is about convincing people that the weapons are stupid weapons, because trust me, dictators don't want stupid weapons. They want to spend their money on stuff that's going to help them conquer the guy next door or do whatever it is that they want to do. And if they're convinced that nuclear weapons are stupid, you know, Kim Jong-un is going to be crying in his beer. If it turns out he starved his country for decades to build these weapons and everyone says, oh, those, pfft, they're obsolete. I mean, he, he'll have to start over from scratch. So I, I acknowledge that there, you know, in a world with bad actors, there's a possibility that someone will act badly. But I don't think nuclear weapons are magic and can conquer the world. I think there's a way you can manage this problem. You can get rid of all the weapons. Somebody cheats, just go back at them. Can I, can I say one more thing real quickly? I always forget to do this. Here's what you can do to help me. You could join Realist Revolt. 
I it's just log in and sign up for the newsletter. That would be great. The more people in our in that I can claim are members, the more powerful the group is. Help me get on podcasts. If you know someone who has a podcast or you know of a really good podcast or, you know, help me get there. Get me in front of groups. I'm happy to talk. I love spending time talking about this. You can tell I'm enthusiastic about the Hiroshima argument, all my pretty slides. I would love to do this, this presentation. And finally, give me advice. You guys do organizing for a living, or at least you do it. You've done it a lot longer than I've been paying attention for. I've been focused on nuclear weapons. If you have advice, help me make this better. And my email address, I'll put it in the chat, is ward at realist revolt. One word, realistrevolt.org. Thank you.